Okay, hi everyone and welcome. This is uh, the second day of the CSDMS clinic on using the CSDMS tools, how to build a couple models. So yesterday we covered Land Lab and today we're gonna cover BMI and PIMT and you get to learn about what these mysterious acronyms mean. So I'd like to start by sharing my screen. All right, and you can see I've started uh, at the repository. So again, this is the repository that we're using with all the notebooks in it. And we used this yesterday as well. And so I want to use this to quickly go through the schedule for today. So I'll scroll down. There's part one yesterday, part two. So uh, we'll start with a, a brief introduction to Pi and T. Eric wants to kind of set the stage for the next part, which is BMI. And then we'll circle back and talk about Pi and T again. As you'll see, as we go through presentations today, these two pieces of software are very closely related. Okay, so with that, again, for logistics, if you have any questions while we're doing our presentation, please type questions in the chat. And as Arena mentioned, we probably have a small enough group that maybe we could try also just, if you wanted to, you know, unmute your mic and ask a question live over the air. I think that could be kind of fun. You know, I, I know I love this. I know Arena loves this, like the classroom experience of being able to interact with people. So if you feel motivated to ask a question live, go for it. I think it'll be fun. It'll think it'll probably add to the workshop environment as well. All right, so with that, uh, I think that's all that I have to start with. I'd like to turn it over to Eric, who will show a little bit about PyMT. Is that cool, Eric? That sounds great. And all yeah, right. if people wanna just jump in and ask questions, that's also fine too. All right. All right, I'm gonna to try to uh, share my screen here. All right, is my screen sharing? Yes. It says it is. Yep. Okay. So um, I guess maybe the best place to begin is where we did yesterday at the GitHub repo for the workshop. So it's github.com slash CSDMS slash CSDMS 2020. And then we'll, uh, again, clone the notebooks that we added so that we can go through the tutorials. So if everyone's there, you can click on, confusingly, the second link here. So get the workshop tutorials for part two, PyMT. So that'll download all the PyMT ones. And then when Mark does his, we'll come back here and you can click on the BMI ones and I'll take it, take you to those. And I, and if someone doesn't have an account yet or can't get on, um, we can, we can take care of that. But if everyone is here, um, I'm going to take you through a quick introduction to PyMT and maybe some motivation for why we wrote PyMT and a quick example. And then I'll hand it back to Mark uh, to uh, explain some of the technology behind BMI and what makes it work. So first, PyMT. So I'll start with a story. Um, it, uh, it begins a long time ago when CSMS was first beginning or when before CSMS began. And there were some meetings to figure out what something like CSMS would look like and what it wouldn't look like. Um, and so this was in the early... 2000s, but I was looking at some pictures recently and, and judging by how young Greg looked, you would have thought it was the early 1980s, but it was only uh, 20 years ago, Greg. One thing that they uh, decided they didn't want was one large model. So there wasn't this one giant model that everyone, <laughs> that everyone would contribute to. Um, they wanted lots of small models. So everyone would contribute small toy models, perhaps. And then those models will, would communicate together with one another. So that was a lot different than what, say, the atmospheric community was doing. So we had to come up with something different. And this is the reason for PyMT. 
and it tries to solve some of these problems. So I've outlined some of the problems here. Um, this mo no notebook is mostly just text, but outlines some of the problems and the s solutions that PyMT tries to implement. So the first problem that we had at the time, this isn't as much of a problem anymore with source code. We needed to get source code from the model developers to the community. And this used to be a problem, um, believe it or not. Um, there wasn't GitHub. And so people would often keep source code hidden for whatever reason in their drawers and, uh, and it was hard to get. So you had to communicate with a professor or a scientist to get that code and you had to ask them for it. And if they were not too busy and nice, they would email you a copy of it. And then you would go and work on that source code and there'd be, you would add something to it and then it would branch and there'd be different versions of models. And so we don't want that. So as part of CSDMS, we've, uh, all the models in PyMT are open source. We ensure that so that you can get the code easily without going through a gatekeeper. And uh, you can run it through PyMT. So all the models in PyMT are available, not always on GitHub, mostly on GitHub, but um, in a public repository. Another problem with all of these different models is that they come from different languages, you know, because we don't have one giant model, we don't agree on a single language to commit the, uh, the code to. And so there's a compiling issue. So all these models are written in different languages by different scientists. This can be the most difficult part of building models and running models. Oftentimes they're written in Fortran or C, which are compiled codes. And you may need some special libraries to install with them or some special secret magical compile flags just to get them to work. So that's a pretty big problem. Oftentimes people just want to, they don't even really want to look at the code. They just want to try out to try to run it. And yet they encounter all these problems with compiling it. So we want to solve this problem. And so in PyMT, as part of PyMT, we build all of the models that are part of PyMT. And so we offer uh, binaries of them, pre-compiled binaries on as many <clears throat> platforms as we can. Generally Mac is the easiest and then Linux and then we'll concentrate on Windows after that. Now we solve this problem primarily through Conda. I think many of you are familiar with Anaconda which is a Python package uh, or a collection of <laughs> Python packages so it's a distribution. And, but one of the things with Anaconda is the package manager that they use called Conda. And Conda is a great thing. It packages up uh, diff, uh, <clears throat> source code into packages that can be just easily distributed, compiled and distributed. Now, Anaconda is primarily Python, but Conda can install uh, programs written in any language. And so we have recipes for each of the models. And then we build these recipes on uh, several different platforms and make them available through a platform called Conda Forge, which is a community uh, repository for Conda recipes. So we, <clears throat> and as part of that, the recipe also gives users a very specific way, or shows them a very specific way to build the models. So if they wanted to compile it themselves, they could. And this is regularly tested. And so this is something that we provide. So it makes it very easy to for new users to install models, as well as more advanced users to maybe tinker with the source code and then recompile it for themselves. A lot of the models don't come with a lot of documentation. Documentation is sort of secondary for a lot of people when they're writing models, but models that are contributed to PyMT can tie into the PyMT and the LandLab documentation system to make it easier to show your users how to run your model and where to get information about it. So the documentation uh, comes with PyMT, as well as some of the testing and the continuous integration that we do with PyMT. So every time someone commits a change to PyMT or one of the models, tests will be triggered and run on several different platforms. And so because they're tied into PyMT, all that machinery is in place. And so you can take advantage of that. Um, and running the model, 
So you, you, you've compiled it, you've installed it, and now you need to run it. Well, sometimes that can be quite confusing, especially when we have these models coming from all different authors and different sources. Many of them are, have very idiosyncratic uh, designs. Their input files are, they're not standard formats, let's say. And so they can be hard to get running. And so PyMT tries to solve that too, by making all models and all components look very similar. And so that if you know how to run one model, you'll know how to run them all, at least to get them started. Uh, debugging, so PyMT, because it is in Python, it's an interpreted language, and it makes it easy to debug models or just to run and play with models, maybe not necessarily debugging them. But we bring models for, that are written in C or C++ or Fortran or Python. We're adding new languages. Uh, we're working on adding other languages as well. But we bring those models written in those languages into a Python framework. And so now you can interactively run the model. So you could step through a model run. So this is a model that was written in C that you would not be able to do this with before. Uh, you could step through in time with the model and then change some inputs maybe, see how that affects some outputs. Um, if you were doing some debugging, you could look at some of the outputs and see when they turn to NANDs or negative numbers or whatever. Um, and you can plot up the results as you're stepping through the model. And this is all because we can bring them into a uh, Python framework. So that is off, <clears throat> that's very useful as well. Um, and then model coupling. And so this is the last one. So PyMT brings a lot of things to your models um, and then also is model coupling. And so when we're coupling different models, there's some problems <coughs> that we encounter like the two different models are written on, uh, written to use different grids. So one model has a structured grid, one has an unstructured mesh, and PyMT provides uh, some mapping capabilities. So we use the Earth System Modeling Framework ma grid mapping tool. So for instance, you could run one model on a rectilinear grid for one time step, map it onto an unstructured mesh, if that's what the other model is running on. Um, and then run that model for a few time steps and then go back and forth. And so we offer that as part of the PyMT package. There's other utilities like uh, unit conversion. So your two models may use different units and we can easily uh, <clears throat> accommodate that. Uh, time interpolation. Perhaps your mo two models are running and they have different time steps and they can't synchronize themselves. Um, they just aren't at the same time step you could run the time interpolator would then run one model, say a little bit past where it needs to go and then save the previous time step and interpolate uh, between those two times to get the value that the other model needs at the, at the correct time. So that's another uh, utility that we offer. So with that, that's sort of the motivation for PyMT and what we, uh, and why, we, and why we wrote it. So now I'll take you through uh, some of the models, or I'll take you through a model and just so you can see what a, a sample model looks like in PyMT. So now you can run, now we'll run some code. So the first thing that you do with PyMT is you import pymt.models. And so pymt.models is a is a sub package or a module of PyMT that contains all of the uh, all of the uh, all the models that we have. Now oh, here I need to. So this so we have some mod some models uh, preloaded on our Jupyter Hub, and this is the ones that we have here. So I'm going to go through several, or I'm just going to go through one model and just to show you what it looks like. So I'm feeling a little bit brave. So you guys are able to pick whichever model you want. I mean, I'm choosing Plume, but the code should work pretty much the same. There's going to be a couple changes for if you had, if you choose another model, 
But regardless, you should be able to run through this brief example choosing any of these models because the interface is the same uh, for all of them. So I'm going to choose a plume model. This is a model that uh, models a, a buoyant plume uh, that entering the, <coughs> entering the ocean, a sediment plume. So the first thing we do, so I'm just going to have this plume. So pl plume with a capital P is a class. And I'm just going to assign it to the name model, just so I don't have to type plume every time. Um, especially if I change the, uh, the model that I'm importing. So yours will look the same. Then we instantiate it like we do with all classes in Python. OK, so now we have a model that we can run. Um, and we can do a lot of things to it. So you can get, just like any object in Python, you can get some help on it. So here, so if you've chosen a model other than plume, you should get a little bit different message. Uh, so here, this model it gives a brief description, or the help message gives a brief description, and the author, and some links, and the license. Uh, we want to make sure that people get credit for their models that they contribute to PyMT so that it doesn't become just part of PyMT and we don't take credit for it ourselves. So we want to make sure that the person who wrote the model is credited. And then if you scroll down, it's a typical doc, doc string for Python. It lists all the parameters that you can pass as keywords. These are all optional for the plume model. Yours will look different if you've chosen a different model. And all these parameters are, <clears throat> are values that you can set for the model before the model starts running. Um, and we'll get to that in just a little bit, but we'll probably come back to the help. The help's awfully useful. Uh, you can also get these values programmatically. So with the, with the parameters attribute of model, that, allow, that returns a, a dictionary of parameter name and the default values. So we list them out here. So this is, again, yours will be different, but this is, so the river mouth velocity for this plume, the default is one meter per second. So all models will look like this, and then we will go to the life cycle of a model. And so this is how you advance the model in time and how you actually can run the model in different steps. So we'll go through this a lot today probably, but uh, I'll just do a brief introduction to this. So the first thing your model needs to do is set up. So this is where it prepares all the input files for the, the model. Uh, the next step was initializing. So it's going to read in all the input files, maybe allocate some memory, and get ready to do some time stepping. The third step is updating. So this is where we advance in time, uh, one time step at a time. And then the finalize is when it's just stuff that's written at the end. So it might be freeing up memory, writing some output files, that sort of thing. So the setup method. So every, every model component has a method called setup. So again, a method is just a function that's attached to a, an instance of a class. So you can call the setup method, as I've done here in the first line. So the first argument to setup is the name of the directory where you want all the input files to go. So in this case, I'm just going to call it my model will be the, the name of the, of the folder where I'm, where, that I'm going to create and put all the input files in. And if you left that out, uh, PyMT would have created a temporary directory in some location, probably starting with the list. input file. And so because uh, we did this, maybe, uh oh, my internet is unstable. Um, it'll just be the defaults. So I, I'm going to show you some of the, just to give you an idea of what's going on here. I will show you 
the output or, or the um, the input files. So if you were to open up a terminal, you don't need to do this. So I'm just going to take you through it. So here's a folder called my model. And it, so it's created three input files for me. And if you wanted to look at one of the files, So here's a, here's just an input file for for the Plume model, and so this is an input file that's specific to Plume, and so, but you don't need to worry about this because you're using PyMT. This is just to to show you what PyMT has done. So it's created a a nice uh, set of input files. So if we go back now to our notebook, as I said, those are just default values. But you could, if you wanted to, change some of the default values to non-default. So here, I'm going to create another folder with uh, the river mouth velocity being pretty fast. So this is two meters per second. The keywords that you would pass to set up are those that we showed earlier. If we scroll up a little bit, um, so you can see them in that help message. So I think these are all alphabetical order. So here's river mouth velocity. So that's how I knew that that was a valid keyword argument that I could pass to it. And there, the default is one meter per second. So I will create a new one with a velocity of two meters per second. And then if you were to go back here, hopefully, So now the velocity is two meters per second. So, so the setup method gives you a nice way to edit uh, model input files in a very standardized way. So, general, so it, to the user using PyMT, they don't have to actually worry about all the idiosyncratic, all the idiosyncratic input files that different models have. Uh, everything is done through the programmatically through keywords. Um, the setup method also allows you to set up multiple input files. So a common use case that I've seen is that people want to do some sensitivity tests on their model. So maybe here you'd want to run plume and see what it looks like for a range of velocities and a range of widths. So what you could do is type some code like I have here. And uh, maybe I'll, yeah, I think we've got time. So we can do this. So we can uh, paste this code into a, into a cell. So we're going to set up some velocities, some sample velocities in widths. So we're going to have widths that range from 100 to 500 meters and velocities range from a half a meter per second to two and a half meters per second. And then all we're going to do is just run the setup method right now. And then we'll create a bunch of input files. And then what people would not usually do is then have uh, maybe run all this on a cluster so that you could run all these independently of one another you know, for a sensitivity test. There, so I just created a number of input files, all with varying widths and velocities. Uh, so the product function here, what it's going to do is take every combination of the velocities and widths. So we have five different velocity samples and five different width samples. So we're going to get a, we should get 25 different input files or input file folders. So if we went back to the Terminal. Uh, I'm in trouble going back here. There we go. To the terminal. So now we have, see, all these sim directories now. So we have 25 simulation directories, each prepared with a different set of uh, velocities and widths. So now you could take this, put it on a cluster, 
uh, run each simulation on a separate node um, in parallel. Good use of a Jupyter Hub terminal, Eric. What's that? Good use of a Jupyter Hub terminal. Oh yeah, thanks. Thanks. That. I love the terminal. I love the terminal. Yeah. All right. Um, so then we do that. So now, so now we've said that we've created a uh, a default. So I'm going to go back and just create this this input file here because I may have screwed things up when I <coughs> now my typing. So now, so so we're going to create a, a default set of input files, and now we call the BMI method initialize. And so the first argument is the file name, and then the second argument is where that file is and where the should where the component should be initialized. Um, not sure why it's taking so long. Oh, so I think I screwed up with the, uh, when I was creating all those input files. So this will probably happen to you when you're running uh, these notebooks and that's totally fine. So if the kernel dies, uh, you can go up here and go to restart. So what probably happened is that I uh, messed up and created an input file with some bad inputs. And so what is gonna happen is that because the underlying model in this case was written in C, the, 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 the model itself doesn't have the really fancy memory management that Python does. And so sometimes if, depending on how the person wrote that model, it may just crash unceremoniously and stop working and that's generally the, the the problem that you see is when the, the kernel dies. Uh, so to clean things up, I'm going to start from the beginning. And then I'll just skip all the way down to uh, the initial step. And hopefully I set that up right. No. Or maybe I created a new, there we go. So now the model is set up and ready to go. So the memory has been allocated, but it hasn't run any time steps yet. So for your model, if you're using a different model, again, you're gonna get different things because right, we're looking at it right now is all the input parameters and output parameters. So these are different than what we passed to the setup method. The setup method were parameters that change that are specified in an input file. And so only, so they don't change through time. They're just initial parameters. Now these input var names and output var names are the names of the variables that can be set while the model's running. So for the plume case, we can set, we can vary the water speed with time. So the river velocity, the river depth, and then the output, uh, there's only one output variable, which is the deposition rate. Uh, <clears throat> so if we do, so actually, why don't we just write the name here? So the output variable, so we're gonna get So we can get information about the output variable in this case, a C bottom sediment deposition rate. Uh, so it's a variable that has units of meters per day. It's on grid one. And so Mark's gonna to get to this stuff. This is a BMI thing. So a model can have multiple different grids and those variables can be defined on multiple grids. This particular variable is defined on grid one and we can get more information about grid one later, but for now, uh, we're just gonna skip over that. And it's defined on nodes. So a grid can have different elements like Greg showed in Land Lab yesterday. Uh, but this case, in this one, it's defined on nodes. And we can get its actual value. So we can do, so the variable will have data or you can also get the same values with uh, the same array with a get value function. That's another BMI method that Mark will talk about. And you can run the model 
And so now I've updated it to, uh, for one timestamp. So we're one day in, and then we should be able to verify that by these other BMI methods, which is get start time, time, and end time. So now we know how to set up a model simulation, initialize it, update it with time, and then the last thing we would do is possibly run finalize, which many times doesn't do anything, but can free up memory to the system uh, so that you can, uh, so you don't run on memory. And then it could output, it could write output files or maybe print some plots or something. So that's quickly what a model would look like. And hopefully it worked for you and it, the, the interface for all of those models that we showed at the beginning, I'm going to scroll up. So evulsion, plume, set flux, subside, all of those methods that we just ran through should work for those. We, uh, you know, you still have to know how to use the model to, to some degree, but you should know at least the logistics of setting it up and running it. And the basis for all of this is the basic model interface, which Mark, hopefully we'll, uh, is ready to talk about. Um, but if there's any questions, maybe we should just take a break and that was, that was pretty fast. So if people have any questions, um, we can answer those now or Mark could uh, move on to BMI. Well, why don't we take just a minute, and see if anybody has any questions. Maybe yeah, you sure. could unshare and I can share. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, I see a question from Saraf. Do you want to take that, Eric? Uh, why the one? Why are not all BMI compliant models on the PyMT? Yeah. Um, so the ones that we have loaded up for on our Jupyter Hub right now are just the ones that are just a, a subsample of them, so that we have some notebooks for them, and we're pretty sure that they're working well and are useful. Um, but um, yeah, so that's why we don't have them all right now. Um, some of them could be 3D. So Sedflex 3D is, well, Sedflex 3D produces three-dimensional stratigraphy. Um, it's a 2D model, but it generates three-dimensional stratigraphy. So the grids, generally we use grids like LandLab where they're plant, uh, plan view and they have uh, you know, an X and a Y. But with BMI, you could also specify 3D, 3D grids. Although we don't, I'm not sure that we really have too many real 3D models. I don't think so. Okay, I'm going to share my screen and start. If you guys have more questions for Eric and us, just you know, add, ask him in the chat. Or again, if you feel bold, unmute your mic and ask over the air. All right. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen, and I think what I'll do is start with some slides. There's no nice keyboard shortcut for this. There we go. All right, can you guys see my slide? Is that there? Yeah, you got it? Okay, all right. Okay, thanks. All right, so Eric has set me up nicely by showing PyMT, which shows an immediate application of BMI. All right, so I'd like to talk about BMI, the basic model interface. I uh, have a series of slides. I like simple slides. So the first slide is what? What is BMI? At its simplest, BMI is just a set of functions. Uh, these functions are used to run the model. Now, there's obviously there's a lot more detail, there's more specialization. But at a high level, it's just a set of functions that you can use to run the model. And the key here is that word standardized. The fact that the basic model interface looks the same for any model written in any language. That's the key thing and the real strength of BMI as well. Why? Why would I want to use BMI? Why is it important? What utility does BMI have? Here I'm gonna use an analogy. This is one that Greg came up with and used at the CSDMS annual meeting last year. 
And I liked it a lot. It really resonated with me. Uh, not necessarily because I'm a car guy or anything, but more because you know, basically everyone that we touch has some experience with a car. You kind of know what a car is and how it works. So why, what's this car doing on my screen? All right, so think of a car. When I get into a car, I have an ignition. So there's a way to start the car. I have controls like a steering wheel, like a brake pedal, like an accelerator. So I can run the car. I have feedbacks. I have like I have a speedometer so I can find out how fast I'm going. I can also set things like I could turn wipers on, for example. All right, so the nice thing is that, you know, with a car, we kind of have this standardized interface. So my wife has a 2013 Subaru Outback, as you see pictured here, you know, so I know how to drive that. Now, the neat thing about the fact that this is a standardized interface is that Say, for example, I go to Home Depot and I want to rent a truck because I want to move a sofa, which I've done recently. The neat thing is, is that without ever having seen that truck, and eventually we got a van, interestingly, I know I'm almost positive that I'll be able to drive that truck and or van because it has a standardized interface. The truck has a steering wheel, it has an ignition, it has a brake pedal, it has a gas pedal. All right, so the fact that the interface is standardized means I'll know automatically how to drive it. And that's again the idea behind BMI. BMI provides a standardized interface for driving models. Where? So where can I get more information about BMI? Right. For this, I'd like to go to the documentation. So this, you know, read the docs.io, the popular site for software documentation. And we've got the BMI name there. So let's go to the web browser. And there. so this is the uh, documentation for BMI. And I think you know, there's, a, there's a lot here. Uh, Eric and I and, and Greg had fun rewriting this earlier this year. Uh, there's two things I want to point out. The first thing is that you know, BMI is an interface. And so for those of you familiar with software engineering, you know, an interface is abstract. You need to actually implement it in order to make it work. And so we have language specifications and examples in four languages, C, C++, Fortran, Fortran and Python. <clears throat> we'll actually use the Python uh, uh, implementation today. And actually, we're even gonna use the Python example, BMI example Python, which you see over here. We're gonna dog food it today. That's another software engineering term. All right, so that's the first thing. So recognize that there are specifications you can look at and examples you can look at for those languages, for these four languages. All right, the second thing is just to show you very broadly, you know, what functions are in the basic model interface. And you can see I have a table here where you can see some familiar names. You know, Eric mentioned initialize and update and finalize. And you can see there are a bunch of other functions as well. And as Greg mentioned yesterday, there's about 30 of them or so. Actually, I have not counted them myself. I should, I should really do that. Anyway, the, uh, the idea is uh, that when you add a BMI to a model, you would basically write these functions. And then inside the functions, you'd have calls into your model. All right, so this is the BMI documentation. Let me go back to my slides. They're hiding here. All right, so my next question is, how? How do we use BMI? And that's what we're gonna do next. So let's go back to our uh, GitHub repo page. All right, and I'm gonna be careful to click the link. The nice thing about the, oh, so I'm scrolling down to find the link where we can get the uh, BMI notebooks. 
And I'm being careful to click this link because I know that I've made changes and Eric has made some changes overnight. So by clicking this, I'll make sure that I have the most recent version. So let me do that. There we go, okay. So this is our little landing page for the BMI examples that I'll use today. I have two notebooks. I think I can get through them pretty quickly. I'm trying to think how much, how much time do you think I should take, Eric? Uh, whatever you need, Mark. Whatever I need, okay. Be careful when you say that. You know I like to talk. <laughs> okay, I'll try to do this in maybe 20 minutes, maybe 10 minutes for each notebook. Okay, you so fine. Get done a little after two. All right, so the, I'd like to look at the first notebook. It's called Run the Heat Model. I'll open that up. There's the fun BMI logo. We had fun with fonts last year, so we have nice fonts for our logos. Okay, again, recognize I like to switch the foreground and background colors in my browser to make it a little easier to see. So when you guys click this, it'll have a white background. All right, and a question as well, uh, is my font size large enough? Is this easy for people to see? Okay, let, let, let us know in the, in the chat window or feel free to unmute your mic and let me know. Okay, so in this notebook, I want to run a model called heat. It's a really simple model. It's just a model of two dimensional diffusion of temperature across a uniform rect rectangular plate. It uses Dirichlet boundary conditions. So basically uh, they're, they're clamped boundary conditions. Uh, it's kind of funny, I didn't realize this, but you know, Greg did the land lab examples yesterday and there's you know, the land lab linear diffuser component, I think is very similar to this actually. So we're looking at diffusion again. Now, I know that it's not the most interesting scientific problem to think about diffusion, but the nice thing is that, you know, as scientists, we're all kind of familiar with diffusion anyway. This is something that's kind of, we learn in classes as we go through school. So it's a concept that's pretty familiar for everyone. So you can think about diffusion, of temperature across the plate. Okay, and again, you can see I'm gonna use the BMI example Python repository. You can actually look at the source code. Let me take just a moment to show that. So you can see in this first paragraph, I have a link to the source code. I'm gonna open that up and take just a couple of minutes to talk about it. Okay, so this is in Python. Uh, again, we like Python and CSDMS. It's an easy language to use and a lot of people are familiar with it. In this file, you can see that there is a function, the solver, all right? So this is the solver that solves the, the diffusion equation. There's then a class called heat. And this class can be used basically to set up the temperature distribution across the plate as well as give things like the uh, dimensions of the plate. So the number of rows, the number of columns, the spacing between the grid cells. Uh, it's gonna be, by the way, a, a, a uniform rectilinear grid, kind of like you know, what uh, Greg used yesterday in the first examples in Land Lab. Uh, it also sets up the diffusivity. I'm trying to think if there's anything else super interesting about this. I think that's about it. Oh, here we go. This is one thing that's interesting. Note that, so note that this, uh, there we go. Note that this heat class has a method. And remember Greg mentioned yesterday, method is just a function attached to, a, to an object. So it has a method called advance in time. So this is what we use to step through time in this model. All right, so this is the heat model, super simple. Again, we could have many different ways of doing this, but this is the one I'll use. This is the one we use across all of our BMI examples. Okay, let's now, as the title says, run the heat model. So I'm gonna, oh, actually, I was gonna say, I'm gonna step through. You can see I've already saved the notebook with output, 
but because it's more fun, because we can be surprised, I'm going to restart my kernel and clear all the output. That way, all the cells will be blank. And so we can see things better as they, as they happen. All right, so I'm going to start stepping through the, through the uh, cells. Recall it's a shift enter to step through a cell. In the first code cell, you can see I import NumPy. We're going to use that for arrays. I'm also importing the heat model. The import's a little clumsy because it, the, the, the package that we created wasn't necessarily set up to have access to this model. But nevertheless, after running this cell, I'll now have access to the heat model. You can see then in the next code cell, I'm going to specify the size of my plate. It's going to have six rows, that's the y direction, by eight columns, that's the x direction. And I'm going to set up a conductivity of one in, you know, whatever you, let's say SI. Meters squared per second, I think. All right, and then, so then we set up the heat uh, uh, object. So using the heat class, I specify the shape and the conductivity through the shape and alpha keywords. What's going to come back will be my object reference M that will be used for the model. So now M is how I'm going to control the heat model. So given the shape and the conductivity, you can see that the heat model solved for two other parameters, the spacing. So the default spacing is used for just one unit meters, if you wish, and the time step. So the time step is set by a stability criterion. So again, if, I get, if I'm assuming SI, it'll be 0.25 seconds. All right, so now I've initialized my I've set up. I want to be careful. Oh, I'm using words. I want to be careful of those words. I'm going to use those words later in BMI. I've started my model there. That's a generic word. All right, so what does the initial temperature field look like? Here I'm using NumPy to set up an array of zeros. So you can see it'll be a six by eight array of zeros. And now, oh, and note that, let me step back just a second. This is probably something I should have pointed out when we were looking at the model code, but temperature is one of the attributes of the model. So this is the actual property that we are going to diffuse across the plate. And you can see the way I've accessed it is as a, an attribute of the M object. And again, if any of this Python object-oriented programming terminology is confusing, please, you know, either open your mic and ask a question or ask through the chat. Okay, so back to where I was. I was going to say we have a blank field. You can see it's all zeros. I'm using ASCII art here as well, <laughs> if you will. All right, so the next step is I'm going to set an impulse. So I have all zeros, but I'm going to set a value of 100 at the location 3, 4. You can see now that our plate, again, is all zeroed out, but there's a spike in temperature near the middle. Now I want to run the model. Here's where I call the advance in time method that I pointed out when we looked at the source code. So what this does is it does one time step. It advances one time step in the model. All right, let's see what happens. If I print the temperature field now, you can see, hey, there's diffusion. All right, so that initial peak of 100 has spread out a little bit by the process of diffusion. Let's see what happens if we keep going. So I've set some distant time, which is two. All right, so while you can see the code, while the time in the model, and again, this is something I maybe I should have pointed out as well earlier, you know, time is kept track of in the model. So while time, while, while model time is less than this distant time, we're gonna keep advancing in time, one time step at a time. All right, so let's see what it looks like now in the future. 
Uh, okay, see we've diffused away. The initial peak has been melted down to about eight, you know, from 100 down to eight. You can see the way the boundary conditions work. You know, they're clamped boundary conditions, they're clamped at zero. So that means basically temperatures diffusing away from this peak, it gets to the boundary and it gets sucked out of the plate. Basically it's absolute zero at the edges of the plate. So that means basically that the temperature isn't conserved. So you can see that if I sum up all the temperatures, you know, the initially it would have been 100, but now it's down to 74. Okay, so this is just a demonstration of a simple model in Python. And what I would like to show next then is the same model, but run through its BMI. All right, and maybe before I do that, are there any questions or comments? Does this make sense so far? Okay, just again, let, holler and let me know. All right, so now I'm back on the page where I can show my second and last notebook for this discussion. So I'm gonna open up the second notebook, run the heat model through its BMI. All right, once again, I'm going to restart the kernel and clear all the output so that we can be uh, entertained and surprised by the outputs. All right, so my goal in this example is to show that we have a BMI written for this Python model, this Python heat model. And I'm gonna do my example running the model through its BMI. So as before, you can see in this first paragraph, I have links again for the model and for its BMI. Let's take again, just a couple of minutes and browse the BMI code. Okay, so you can see here that in this file, I have a class here called BMI heat. And this class contains a series of methods. And you can see those method names again, should look familiar. They should look similar to what Eric showed when working with PyMT. So there's an initialize, there's an update, there's a finalize, and then there's a bunch of others. And you can see that what we've did, we, what we did, what we've done, and actually, I, 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 that was a Freudian slip because this is what Eric did. And I think I did a little tiny bit, but this is mostly Eric you can see that we've just filled in code in each of these methods. So the code in each of these methods hooks into the heat code. So for example, you know, if I do an update, you know, so the BMI update method is meant to advance a model by one time step. You can see inside that update method, it's a single line. It's just calling the models advance in time method. Mark, I have a question. Go for it. So um, in this example, there's one non-field uh, input, the conductivity, right? Yeah. Um, is there a BMI method that say you had a BMI uh, enabled model that's like get input or output var names that's tell me all the inputs what their units are and so forth in this case it would list like i need the conductivity in this case it's maybe a little trivial there's one input i can think of examples that might have 35 or 100 where having that interface could be really valuable are maybe i've just missed where that is exposed no that's okay let me, let me see if I can repeat back and to make sure I, I understand your question. So you're saying it would be nice to have a function that would give back like the name and other information about a variable, like its type, its uh, units, for example. Is that what you're asking? No, I'm, I'm um, saying that there, so um, there are sort of two types of inputs. There are things that are called like, that, that BMI calls var, 
right? Input var and output var. But then in the case of something like this heat model, there's another type of input, the thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity type input, right? That needs to be provided to the initialize. Okay. Right. And is there a way that I looking through the BMI functions, I don't see where that information is exposed other than in like looking carefully through the template input files. But that takes you back to where you would be typically, which is looking through example input files. Yeah, this is something it's, uh, it seems like it would be handled in PyMT, for example, through the parameters attribute, where, you know, in PyMT, we have access to all of these variables that aren't necessarily standard inputs or outputs, but are parameters of the model. And so we don't really have something like that in BMI. You know, okay. BMI just, yeah, BMI just talks about the variables that are exposed for input or output. Yeah, which I might call state variables as compared with parameters. But sometimes parameters are not single values. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Sure. And we can talk more about this as well afterward, too. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Katie. That was Katie, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. So, th this is uh, just a quick look at the code. That it is, is that, that involved in making the BMI for the heat model. Okay, let's go back to the notebook and let's run through the notebook. Okay, so again, recall shift enter in, Jup in a Jupyter notebook to advance. All right, in the first code cell, you can see I'm importing uh, a couple packages, so OS and NumPy once again. You can see here also I'm importing the BMI heat. Uh, module from, or the BMI heat class from the heat module. So it's set up a little more nicely here. All right, so once I've imported the class, I can create an instance. So here I'm calling it X. So now X is the way we will control the heat model through its BMI. We can call, just because this is something really simple, I like to use this at the beginning just to check that things actually worked. I'm going to call the get component name method. It's a really simple one, and I feel assured then that the BMI is actually working. So that's good. So you can see it gives back the name of the model. All right, so whereas in the last example, so let me see if I can navigate here. So this is the first notebook. You can see that the way I set up the heat model is through keywords. I'm choosing a slightly different tactic this time and instead using a configuration file. All right, so let me show this is a, again, this is kind of a bridge between the heat example and what Eric showed with PyMT, where with PyMT we use a configuration file. All right, so you can see this configuration file is in the YAML format. YAML, yet another markup language, is a format that we love at CSDMS because it's simple and it's text-based. So you can see the configuration I'll use. I'll have, again, a six by eight element array. I'll have one unit between grid cells. The origin will be at zero and the conductivity will be one. This is actually the same setup that I used in the heat model example in the other notebook. Okay, so next then I want to use this configuration file to initialize my model. And again, that's a familiar name right there. You know, and the initialize method is used in PyMT as well. And you can see this is why, because of the BMI. All right, so at this point now we have started the model. This is like getting into the car and turning the key to start the engine. Let's take a look at some information. So I could be looking, for example, in my car at the speedometer. <clears throat> Hopefully I'm going zero when I start. <clears throat> you know, I could look at the gas gauge. I could see if my lights are on. So here's some information. I can get information about the start time, the end time, the current time, the time step, and the time units. All right, so we start at zero. 
and the current time is also zero. The end time was just set to a really large number, so we don't have to worry about running into the end. The time step is 0.25, and this again is the same thing as we set up in the first example, and this is in seconds. Okay, so along the lines of showing information about the model, next I want to show the input and output variables. And this is what I was referring to a little bit in that discussion with Katie. You know, the idea is that BMI is interested in what goes into the model and what goes out of the model, the publicly available pieces of information. And you can see here, I have a link. I, I don't want to take a, a, a huge amount of time here, but just to mention CSDMS standard names. Uh, in the first talk uh, this morning by Julie, uh, she mentioned geoscience standard names. And so CSDMS standard names are actually a precursor and they, uh, they kind of feed into geoscience standard names. The idea of a standard name is basically a very descriptive name for a variable. I'll show you what I mean. So you can see that the variable called plate surface underscore underscore temperature is used as an input and as an output variable for this model. And the reason why this is very descriptive, so there's no confusion about what just temperature means, because temperature could mean many things. Next, I want to get some information about the grid that we're using. I mentioned earlier, and you saw in the heat example, that it's going to be just a two-dimensional regular rectilinear grid. So there are BMI methods that can be used to describe this. First of all, the grid identifier. As Eric mentioned, there can be many grids in PyMT and therefore in, in BMI. Grids are numbered just with, as an index, so the first one is zero. There's one grid in this model, so it's going to be index zero. The grid rank is two because it's two dimensional. You can see the shape that we have set, the spacing and the type. Okay, so again, imagine you're in the car, you're getting information about what's happening with the car before you start driving it. Next, I'd like to do the same thing as we saw in the heat example. I'm gonna set the initial temperature field to be a bunch of zeros with a spike of 100 kind of near the middle. Now, maybe before I hit return here, just so you can see how this works. I'm using a NumPy function to set the array and I'm using the BMI set value function to set the temperature using its standard name. Okay. So let's now get that temperature back out again and display it. So you can see again, we have our six by eight element array with a spike in the middle. Let's advance the model by one time step. So we use the BMI update function. And then let's take a look at what happened in the model. So we'll use get value to get the new temperature from the model. And you can see again, there's diffusion. So our initial spike has diffused away. And again, let's advance the model to some distant time, distant time being two. So uh, similar to what we saw earlier, we're gonna check the current time, the current model time, and keep advancing the model until distant time is reached. Then finally, well, penultimately, we can view the results. So again, that initial peak has melted away, the boundary conditions are clamped, so it's zeros around the edges. And again, you know, temperature isn't conserved. Finally, we can finalize the model, freeing up any memory. Okay, so at this point, maybe you're looking at me in the little window here in my share screen and thinking, Mark, 
why did you do this? It's the exact same thing. Look, it's the exact same thing we did in the heat model. The numbers are even the same at the end. What did we gain by putting a BMI on the model? It's the same thing, but that's exactly the point. All right, so the cool thing is, is that we have run this model with a standardized set of functions. And as Eric pointed out earlier, once you've seen one BMI, you've seen them all because it's all the same set of functions. So the really cool thing about this is that I get excited about, I'm not sure, quite, sure, quite sure I can convey well, is that we have a standardized interface on this model. I don't need to know anything about what's inside the model. All I need to know is how to run the interface. So this is the cool thing about BMI. I think that's it. All right, so uh, are there any questions or comments? Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing. I see lots of stuff in the chat. I'm hoping Eric is doing a bunch of stuff. Yeah, all right. Okay. So it, again, if you take a couple moments if you want to ask a question in the chat, that's cool. Otherwise, or you can open your mic and ask a question. Otherwise, I know Eric had a, a small break scheduled. Eric, is this a good time to take the break? Yeah, we could take a break. Yeah, there was a question mark about uh, being able to print out all the variables uh, with a single function call, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Like with like the... Uh, We're printing them out. Um, I'm not sure which line that was. Yeah. Let me share my screen. I, I may be wrong, but I think this refers to the um, printing out grid ID, grid rank, grid shape, grid space, and grid type, and so on. And that seems kind of tedious to have to do all that one at a time. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm picking up on Eric's answer in the chat. Um, if you want an interface that's language agnostic, you have to go with the sort of the least common denominator among languages. And of course, languages like, you know, C and Fortran are pretty basic as compared to something like Python, which has dictionaries as data structure. Um, and so that's why some of the BMI functions can seem a bit basic or primitive. They very deliberately don't take advantage of high level languages like Python because um, they need to be able to speak Fortran and C and, and a variety of different things. Well, I just saw a question from Muriel. So she asked, uh, what dimension does distant time have? Is it seconds or time steps? Uh, so it'll be in seconds. So it'll be, it'll be a time as opposed to a, a, a change in time. Okay, well, it's a uh, 2.12. How long is the break, Eric? Well, I think we had five minutes. Five minutes. Is that, is it too cheesy to say come back at 2.17? <laughs> uh, yeah, we could do that. All we right. could say 2.20 probably. Okay. <laughs> if we keep talking, it'll be five minutes then. Yeah, exactly. All right. Okay. So let's meet back at 2.20. We'll see everyone in just a little bit. And we'll hang out if you have any questions as well. Yeah.
All right, we'll start in just a little bit when Eric gets back. I'm here. Oh, you're here? Oh, sweet. Yeah. Hey, Eric, how you doing? I'm doing all right. You got enough coffee? Well, my, my cup is empty. Yeah, that's unfortunate, yeah. Eric, you want to take it away? Yeah. Did we say, I forgot what time we said. Are we ready? Oh, Are you all back? 2.20, yeah. Okay. Um, sure, yeah. Um, there were a couple of questions that maybe we, uh, I thought I thought of a couple of things over our break okay. uh, about BMI. Uh, so the BMI is written to be as easy to implement as possible. So we want to make it easy for model developers to add BMIs to their models. As such, like and as Greg mentioned, we wanted to make it agno language agnostic, so that we can't use fancy uh, language specific syntax. And so that results in a BMI that looks a little bit clunky sometimes. So you have to make each of those calls about the get var uh, units and grid and all that stuff that we were talking about before the break. Uh, and that's by design. And but uh, and that's another reason for PyMT to make using the BM, a BMI enabled model or component easier and more natural in a language like Python. For instance, you in one function call, you can get all the information about a variable or a grid just in one single function call. Um, <clears throat> another question was about how BMI handles grid mismatches. And the answer is that it doesn't at all. Uh, we could have designed BMI differently where we could have had a BMI where one component could ask another component to get its variables and map them or do unit conversions and then return them. But that put way too much, um, it was it would, it put more um, work on the, the developer of the BMI. So the, every, every BMI model would have to provide all this grid mapping capability, which seemed just to be way too much work. And so all of that stuff is left up to the framework. So a model that has a BMI only reports about itself. It says, you know, this is my grid. This is what it looks like. If you can do something with it, great. If you can't, you can't. Uh, but it's not up to the BMI or the BMI implementation to do those things. And then the other thing was to get a model into PyMT, there's a few things that we need to do. One is to run it through something that we call the Babelizer, which wraps it. Uh, so a, a model written in some other language wraps it in such a way that we can bring it into PyMT. And then the other thing was that we uh, need to provide some imp template input files. And this actually gets a little bit to Katie's question too. So how do we, uh, how do we create these input files with all these input parameters so these are the input parameters that don't change with time. So in the setup method, they're keywords. And so you need to provide a set of input. You need to describe those input parameters and describe the input files that they get placed into. And I can <clears throat> show you a quick example of what that might look like, I think. So, um, I'll just try to do this quickly. We can talk about it at some other time. 
So, but just quickly, so this is what some of the metadata files look like for the plume model that I showed earlier and how they would be used to get a model into PyMT. So you could look at the parameters.yaml file. This describes all the input parameters for a particular uh, model input file, so the plume input file. So for every input parameter, it has a description of what it is, its units, a typical range, a default value, the data type. And then what a template input file would look like, well, here's the plume flood file. So it looks like a, it would be, it would look like a regular input file, except it has all these double curly braces. And so the setup method knows to where to put the keywords that you pass to the setup method into the input file. And so that's how the input files get created. So that's, those are the, a couple steps that you'd have to do to get a BMI enabled uh, component or model into PyMT. Maybe so, one other, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. One other comment is, uh, you know, we support four languages, you know, C, C++, Fortran, and Python, but there are BMIs that are written for other languages as well. Like I, I think some people at Delft have written a MATLAB BMI and an R BMI. Julia. Julia, right. I've got the, my old, my, my Java one that I haven't, I haven't looked at in a little bit, but that's still valid. Yeah. Yeah, BMI itself is language agnostic. You can write a BMI for any language. Uh, PyMT though, to get into PyMT, we need to have a bridge that goes from that language to Python. And I think there are for, there is one for Java. So right. yeah. we just have to implement it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's let me close up my stuff there. So if we go back to, well, maybe we'll go back to, to our project page. And then I will click on the launch the PyMT notebooks again. And now I'll go through two examples. Um, it's gonna, they're gonna have to be a little bit quick, but we can, I think we can do it. So I'm gonna run through a standalone PyMT model and see what a real model looks like in PyMT and how you would run it. And then we can couple a couple models and you can play with either one of those. So we'll run a standalone model in PyMT. So the model that we're going to run <clears throat> in PyMT here is called HydroTrend. Uh, it's a 2D hydrologic water balance uh, and transport model. So it's a lumped model where you specify a bunch of parameters about a, of a, a basin, and then it will predict the uh, sediment discharge at its outlet. I'm not sure if you want to describe it at all, Arena. You're, you're kind of the expert on this. I mean, uh, um, it depends a bit on like, I think it, it might be cooler for people to play with the Jupyter notebook than to get too much detail, detail about HydroTrend. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'll, I can say a few words about it. And yeah, then, quickly, we don't have too much time actually. I know, I have like two or three slides in that. Shall I share them like real quick? Uh, it's up to you. Okay. Um, Do you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. It'd be good. So, so the model that Eric's talking about is called HydroTrend. And the way you need to think about this is, is it's sort of a simple uh, mass balance hydrological model. And so it's climate driven and it transports water through like a set drainage basin. But then what it really is intended to do is to like um, predict at the river mouth, so at the, the outlet of, of a certain basin, what kind of daily water and sediment flux comes out of it. Um, it can be applied everywhere in the world for, for um, a drainage basin that you have um, both topographical characteristics for as well as these climatological drivers. Um, 
and it's been used that way too in like like pretty much on every continent there are some applications um and so the things that in a notebook you can start changing would be like the uh, input precipitation or like the temperature in your drainage basin um, and we're using a um, default basin in the example that Eric will be showing which is uh, for the Waiapoa basin in New Zealand so there like your geometry and your drainage basin is all set up already um, and so these are like the the geometry factors and then maybe to super quickly say like it's a water balance model so it calculates um the components of like rain groundwater snow nival precipitation and even put transpiration to like for each part in the drainage basin to determine what the water outcoming water is and then it uses this long-term suspended sediment load equation which is completely empirical and comes from um, um, analysis of like many drainage basins in the world to predict suspended sediment load and in the notebook um, like some of the things that you can play with have to do with the controls that ca came out of the regression basically that um, the the that establish this equation so like you can like change like lithology or trapping efficiency etc so maybe those are like just a very simple background um notes to this model thanks Irina. i'll hand it back over to you sure oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to run a hydrogen example. And so you'll have a pretty good idea of how this all works because it's, you know, if you know how to use one model, you know how to use them all. So we do some imports. We import the hydrogen model. And then we can uh, run some, some base cases. So we're going to do the setup. We're going to run it for 100 years. So the run duration is one of the input uh, parameters. And if, uh, and again, you could do help on hydrogen. And you, if you scroll down to the parameter section, you would be able to see that somewhere down here, hydrogen takes a lot of input parameters. Uh, the run duration is one of the things that you would you could specify there. So if you wanted to run this um, with some other input parameters, you could just add those as keywords in the setup method. And then we will <clears throat> initialize and the model. So now hydrogen is ready to go. And we can print out this, uh, the time, the current time. So we're at the beginning. We're going to run it for 100 years. Now the input var names method. So this is like the method that Mark showed for the BMI that's called get underscore uh, input var names. In PyMT, it's a little bit uh, shorter to match. So it looks more Pythonic. So in Hydrotrend, you notice there are no input var names. So this means that once Hydrotrend starts time stepping, you can't change any of the inputs. All of the inputs are specified in the uh, setup method or in the input files. But there's a bunch of output var names. Um, and they're all, as Mark said, they're all specified in uh, the CSMS standard name format. And so some of them have unusual names are hard to figure out. But uh, so like, let's see here, what's one? Channel exit water sediment bed load mass flow rate is simply bed load flux. So it takes a little bit of knowing what those names mean, but they need to be specific so that you can couple them to other models and know what variables you're actually coupling. So now we're going to do some time stepping. So again, this look this is typical of a BMI model in PyMT and how you would time step through it. We're going to calculate the number of time steps, uh, allocate some arrays. We're going to save here the time series of uh, discharge, and then we're going to uh, run through a series uh, of daily. Uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, 100 years of daily discharge we've just generated. 
And so it's as easy as that. So now we can plot it. And there's our, our discharge for the uh, 100 years. Um, then we've got some, we had some exercises here that you could, uh, so you could analyze some of the data. Um, but we're, since we're running out of time, I can just kind of go through them. So we have, uh, so we have uh, discharge, sediment discharge, bed load flux, and we can calculate the average over the 100 years with typical NumPy functions because we're just, we're, the PyMT just returns the, the NumPy arrays. So it returns all the data as NumPy arrays. And then we use the var units BMI method. And we can do things like calculate the, the year that contains the maximum discharge, and what the, its value is. Annual means. And then, so we had a question here, and we were going to have you all, if you, we can still do this quickly if you'd like. Um, so what I've done here in this cell, I've pasted all of the, all of the code from each of the cells into one cell, so you can just play with what a hydrotrend run in with just running the single cell. And so the question was, uh, what happens to river discharge of suspended load and bed load if the mean annual temperature, in this case, um, increases by four degrees Celsius over the next 50 years. So if we just ran the cell right now, we would just use the defaults again for 100 years. But if we wanted to change this, the increase in uh, temperature per year by four degrees Celsius, we'd have to figure out how to do that. Now we know that, so if you remember from up top with the uh, input bar names, there are no input bar names. So we can't do this dynamically as it's running. So that means we have to do it in an input file. Uh, so we do this through the setup method. So we're gonna have to add a keyword to the setup method to enable this. Now what that keyword is, I don't remember, but if you, you could get help on it, somewhere down here, there will be a, a keyword for this. And it may be this one here, change in mean annual temperature. So if you put that into the setup method, I guess we can try this. Then you should be able to run this cell. So I think the units it said were degrees per year, so we can try just four and then run it again. Well, apparently that didn't work. Yeah, you're changing it by like four degrees a year instead oh. of so like it, it goes too fast over 100 years. Okay. And it, and it does like that parameter does have boundaries. So like it would. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. It would be like 0 0.04. Yeah. Well, we can try that. Um, as I mentioned before, that when you, when you run this, a lot of times the kernel will crash because you will crash uh, one of these models that doesn't have uh, the same error handling as other models. Uh, so. And then you can also try to different values in the setup method and you can run your own simulations if you'd like. Hey, Eric. Yeah, sure. Can you show like that the error messages is in the thermal in the terminal? Like oh, if you yeah, I think so. open up the terminal because that's turned out super handy when we were using these. Okay, yeah, sure. I'll see if I've got that. Oh, where? No, I'm not because I'm running on the Jupyter Hub. I don't think I can. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought there was a way to like open up a terminal there too. Mark, did Mark use that? No, maybe not. Um, there, so now we ran it with uh, a valid uh, change in mean annual temperature. And then so, so you could add different values, uh, different keywords. You don't have to specify just one. It could be any number of those that are uh, in the parameters file here. Um, and depending on the value you choose, you may crash the model just like you would if 
if you were running it um, straight from the terminal. But hopefully, hopefully you will. Anyway, so that's that's the hydrotrim model, and that's how you would run a simple model, one D or a simple uh, PyMT model, without coupling it. But I'll um, you can continue playing with this if you like, and we're going to leave the Jupiter Hub up running for um, another day or so. Well, we're going to leave it up for quite a while, but we're going to leave it up for the next day or so at this level, so that lots of users can come and and run their things. But I will go now to a coupling example. That's going to couple two models. It's going to couple a coastline evolution model. And there's, so we're going to run that. And then we're going to couple it to a waves component so that we can change the incoming wave climate with time and see how that affects longshore transport. So we're going to start with the same imports as we normally would. And so I'm going to show you the coastline evolution model right now. And so it's called CEM. So the coastline evolution model, so this is a plan view model. So it's going to be a rectilinear grid. And there's going to be a coastline with a sediment input. And so it's going to build out, slowly build out a delta. And then that delta will be acted on by waves coming at various angles. And there'll be a long short transport. So that's a quick description of the CEM model. And now we can start stepping through it. So the input bar names for this, so there's now there are some input bar names. So as the model advances, we can change, well, for what we have here, we can change the wave height, the wave period, um, the uh, angle that the waves are coming in. Those are the main inputs to the CEM model that we can change. And then <clears throat> also, there's also some outputs, like uh, the main one being uh, seawater depth. And just like all models, you use the input and output var names to get those. And you'll notice this, there's this one long name here that we can examine. And so this is uh, the incoming angle of the waves. And then you can get the, the VAR type, the VAR units, the grid, and the node count. And let's see if I insert a cell above, you should be able to do so CEM. Uh, so some of that, so this is a, so CEM.VAR, if I've, Sure, what is going on there? Oh, because it's not an output, so we can do nothing. Is that right? Um, um, I'm not sure what's going on there. In any case, we'll. That's strange. You can, anyway, guys, you can get the, what, using the typical BMI methods, you can get all the data that, uh, for each of the variables. Um, and then as before, the life cycle of the, of the uh, component. So it starts with the setup method. And then the initialize, you call it initialize. So here we're going to set up a, a, a model with uh, 100 rows and 200 columns, and the spacing of the grid cells is 200 meters. So now we've set that up, all the memory's been allocated and it's ready to time step. The, <clears throat> let's see, 
So the input variables, we see there are some input variables this time. So we're going to set some of the inputs for the incoming wave angle and period and height. We're just going to set them to be constants right now, but we can you can change them to something else later if you'd like, or right now if you'd like. I've set, so one thing to remember is that the wave angle is going to be in radians. So I've set this to be zero. You could change it to something else, 45. Zero means that the waves are coming straight into the coast. So we're going to set those right now. The, uh, so the grid for seawater depth, so VAR grid is two. So we know that the, so again, every very, every every input VAR or output VAR in a BMI model is defined on a grid. And so in this case, it's grid ID 2. And so we can get some information about grid ID 2 by calling the BMI methods. So grid type, grid number of dimensions, shape, spacing, the origin. So this is a uniform rectilinear grid of rank 2, so that's two dimensions. The shape is 100 rows by 200 columns. That's what we specified in the setup method. And the spacing is 200 meters by 200 meters. So that's the grid that we're going to be looking at. And then we're, I've got a convenience function here to plot up grids as in time. So as we start to step through the model, we can see easily print, uh, plot the output. <clears throat> so now we're going to look at just the initial uh, bathymetry of the model. So we allocate a variable z, which is just a numpy array of the correct shape because we use the, the BMI method. Then we get the value for seawater depth. So this again, this is the BMI get value method. And then we specify a keyword argument uh, called out, which tells uh, the method tells get value where to put the output. If you didn't provide this, it would have allocated a new array and returned that. And then we're going to plot the, these z values to, or send them to uh, the plot coast function. So we, you can see that we start out with a flat coastline uh, that's going into the ocean. And again, we can plot information about each of the input variables. So we know that the, so we can get the units. So we know that's units of radians, for instance, for the, the incoming wave velocity. Uh, the VAR grid, oh, so we already got, so this was uh, the bed load mass flow rate. So this is gonna be the input sediment, the sediment that we're inputting into the model. And this also is on the, on grid ID two, so it's going to be on the same grid as we just plotted. And so it'll have the same dimensions and spacing. Now, because the bed load mass flow rate is an input variable, we need to set it to be something. And so we'll set it to be 750. And that's, uh, I think it's kilograms per cubic meter or uh, per second. No. Now, one thing to notice here is that the, the bed load mass flow rate is a grid. So it, it's a grid that has the same size as the, as the bathymetry or the elevations. So you can specify multiple sources of sediment. And what we're going to do here is specify sediment entering in the middle of the grid right here. And it's just going to go straight across the coast and into the ocean. So it's very simple right now. So that's where we specified it here. So QS is our input sediment, row zero, and then column 100. So again, it's 200 columns wide, so it's just going to be right in the center. And we're going to have it go straight out. So the set value method is how you set parameters inside the, a BMI model. OK, now we're going to run the code for 3,000 days. And then each time step, we're going to set the sediment input. And then we're going to, <clears throat> then we're going to look at the output after 
uh, 3000 days. So it should take, and I think it just takes about 30 seconds to run. So again, we have uh, sediment going straight out, waves coming straight in at a constant, with a constant sediment supply. I think maybe a couple people are running it because it's taking a little longer than it usually does. It's nice to know the limitations of our Jupiter Hub. Yeah, yeah, that's it's running pretty well actually, but not but a little slower, maybe fifty yeah. percent slower. Uh, okay, so now we have got some new outputs, and so we've called the get value at the end of the loop uh, for the seawater depth. And so we can plot it up and see what, see what we've got. So nothing too exciting yet, but we've got now a little delta. It's prograding straight out with waves coming straight in. So I think that's more or less what you would expect in such a case. So now, if you guys would like, you can play with, uh, play with the model yourself. So again, what I've done here I've copied all the steps that I took above into one single cell. So you can just run that cell over and over again with different inputs. Um, you can try different things. You could modify the wave energy. Um, and there's, there's, there's a balance between the wave energy and the sediment load. And that really determines what the delta looks like. So you could change that. Um, or the wave angle, the incoming wave angle you could change. You could make the incoming wave angle be you know, pulled from a distribution. And so you can feel, <clears throat> feel free to change those. Um, you can move the river mouth around over time. So what I have down lower is an example where the river mouth is moving back and forth through random walk. So each change in the river mouth uh, horizontally, uh, the change in the location is drawn from a normal distribution with a given standard deviation. So you could put that in and then run that and see what and see what happens. So I can leave that up to you to do yourself. But since we're running out of time, feel free to do that while I'm continuing talking or you know, we'll stay on after after three o'clock and we can we can go through that. Um, I've added a couple. This Evulse River does the random walk. So if you were to do that example, you would have to use the Evulse River function. I think, Eric, this is a good example of a model where like you don't control the errors that it will throw. Oh yeah, for sure. So, <laughs> so like, especially with playing with like really weird wave angles coming in, yeah. if people do that, that's like um, a, known, a known thing to crash the coastal evolution model yeah. well. Yeah, and it'll definitely, you know, if you, if you give it unusual parameters, it'll definitely produce an unusual looking delta. There's, if you guys are running this, you may encounter what we call the Christmas tree delta, and it's got this weird delta with these spits coming out that's very unrealistic looking, but you can get it if you use the wrong set of input parameters. Um, although it doesn't actually cause the model to crash in that case, but yeah. Um, so I'm going to skip the uh, implementing any of these examples. Well, wow, I don't know. Yeah, we'll come back to it. We'll, we'll get to the a coupling example of just changing, coupling it to a wave model that provides incoming wave uh, heights and periods and angles that matches more closely what the original CEM paper was looking, or one of the original CEM papers was looking at. So in this case, we're going to import, so we've already imported the CEM component, and now we're going to import what we call the waves component. And then as before, we're going to run the setup method for waves. We're going to run the initialize method on the waves. And then we're going to time step it and using the waves.update method. Um, so we're going to set uh, the angle asymmetry and the angle highness factors. And these are just two very particular parameters to this model. And then we're going to run it. So now we've generated I guess a thousand time steps of data, and then we can just see what it looked like. So this is a, 
an unusual distribution where the they were trying to examine how in, high incoming wave heights uh, affects the shape of the delta. So you can see here, so on the x-axis, it's degrees. So again, zero means the waves are coming straight in. Um, and then so there's a large number of waves coming from one direction. Uh, that got more coming from more than more, coming from one direction more than the other. So again, I've copied the all the steps needed to run the both the CEM and the waves component into one cell that you can run. And so you can see it's pretty much the same as it was before. We import the models, we instantiate waves, we run its setup method with the the two parameters that we're going to use and then we initialize it. Then we do the same thing with CEM um, using the same parameters as we used before. And again, we set the, now we're setting the, the Q at the sediment input to uh, at the same place on so the center of the grid, it's going straight out and then we advance it through time. And at each, now the, at each time we're going to have to get a new wave angle and height and period, or new wave angle rather from the from the waves model. So to do that, so for every time step in the loop, we we run waves one time step. Then we use a get value method to get the value at that time step. And then we call the set values on CEM. So we run the waves model, we get wave angles, then we set them into CEM, and then we update the CEM model by one time step. We do that for 3,000 days. So again, we can run that and then we'll get a different looking delta than we did before. It'll be more asymmetric, or it should be. And so feel free to play with any of those parameters. Um, if you crash the kernel, that happens. You just have to restart it and, uh, and try again. There, so it's completed. And then we've created a little bit, a little delta, and it's just starting to build out, and I think it's going to start building spits pretty soon. Uh, so, but that's what it would look like, a uh, coupled example. This is a simple one, but the pattern is the same. You run the, the setup and the initialize method for each of the components that you're wanting to couple. You then have a time loop, and you update each of the components in the order that you want. You get the value from one component, then you set the value into another component, and you go back and forth like that for every time step. And because the, all the methods are standardized, it's, it's very similar for, for any model coupling that you want to do. This is just a simple one. And feel free to just play with it as you like. Um, and as I said, we'll um, continue uh, We'll hang out here if you would like to play with it some more. But that's basically how you would couple several uh, models together in the in Pi and T. That's it. All right, good job, Eric. We're like perfectly at three o'clock. Yeah, I'm sorry I, I rushed it at the end, but um, like I said, we can stick around. Yeah. Uh, Mark and I got a little too uh, chatty, I guess. <laughs> Apologies. Hey, Eric, I was wondering, shall we uh, pull up the uh, PyMT read the docs site and so that people, if they want to like continue on or like play outside of the, these examples? Sure. Yep. So we can, uh, so if you go back to the uh, project page, uh, we should have some of these links here. So the Python modeling toolkit. So under links, that should, I think, point to the read the docs page. So that's one way to get there. Otherwise, you can remember that it's just pymt.readthedocs.io. 
And so this will take you there and it'll have some more notebooks, um, uh, some descriptions about how to use PyMT and some of the models in PyMT. I, I mean, the other thing that I think uh, we are, because this is such a short like demo kind of workshop, we don't go into like, how would you install this on your own machine? But the notes here in the PyMT read the docs should help a lot with if people want to like do a conda install of these tools and um, like run them on their local environments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, we've got a good question here in the comments. This is from Sarah. Uh, is there a method to change parameters of coupled models without reinitializing the model? Uh, you would normally have to reinitialize the model, I think, if I'm understanding the, the, the question correctly. Right, that's what I was thinking. Again. Yeah. Uh, good, I'm glad, Rachel, I'm glad you asked that. I was going to say, if there's one thing that you get out of this model or this uh, talk today, it's about the progress bars. The, uh, <laughs> There's this, there's this package in Python called TQDM. TQDM. <laughs> Apparently it's, okay. it's an acronym for something that, anyway. Um, so if you have a loop and you just wrap that loop like this, it will uh, generate a nice progress bar. So that you don't have to just like print out the time step every time to, so that you know that it's doing something. Although it, often is completed while it stucks at 99.9%. .9%. Yours does? Yeah. Sometimes. Round off, floating point error. I yeah. know, or it's like a, like a counter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they used to float instead of an int in their counter. Oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Something. Or like they didn't start at zero, but at yeah. one or like whatever. <laughs> yeah. Vaclav has a, has a question about uh, update versus update until. Yeah, that's a good update. one. Update is a, is a BMI method and it's required. So it will update a model just one time step, whatever the time step is for that model. However, it's often useful to have an update until method for models. Most models can implement this and if they can, they really should. And so the update until method would take as one, arg so the update method doesn't take any argument. The update until method will take a time argument. So when you're coupling two different models, you want to you, you would ideally like to have them in sync. So you would say, okay, I'm gonna update this model until some time step, which is perhaps the time step for the other one. That would be a good idea. And then, so that's the difference between the two models. However, some components just for whatever reason, they can't implement that. And if they can't, they can't. And that's just the way we have to deal with that. But that's what the update until method does. Eric kind of wanted to update until to go away. I saved it. No, oh, I no, it shouldn't go away. <laughs> but I mean, it's optional, you know. And some of these methods, some of the BMI methods are optional. You don't have to implement absolutely every single one of them if your component just doesn't do some of those things. Yeah. Well, so I mean, the, you have to implement them, but you could just return. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You have to tell PyMT that you have not implemented that. Yeah. Thing. Right. Um, so. Yeah, so that's how it would work. We want to make it as easy as possible for people to implement. Yeah, you may remember we saw an example yesterday of a, of a model that had variable time steps. And so if you were running that and coupling it with a model that has fixed time steps, you might find it easier to use update until so that you're telling a model, look, take as many steps as you need until you get to exactly, you know, three weeks from now, and then stop, pause there. Yeah. I enjoyed Rachel's comment in the uh, chat. <laughs> Oh, Arena, I have a question. Did, didn't Stephanie make a tool that allowed you to take some watershed and make it into a HydroTrend hypsometry file? Uh, 
Oh, Irene, I think you're muted. Yes, I think that's true. I haven't touched it. Or no. like, it's not working with the current versions of what our tool sets, okay. but I do have the GitHub repository of it. And like, we can make this happen. It was one of the things that came out of the class that we I was teaching with some of the tools too, because it provides flexibility for people. Okay. It uses a hydro sheds global data set of drainage basins, like a global coarse resolution DEM, and then automatically spits out for um, a certain drainage based on what is the hypsometry file. Okay. Nicholas had a question about that. And I can yeah, I saw it. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not without like a little bit of modification, it would not be implementable straight away. I put up for people who the people who are still along here, I put up the link to our help desk too, or like to show you that there's like this option. If you like start playing around with these tools or these uh, things and you encounter problems, then um, CSDMS is running a help desk on GitHub. And um, so you just go, I mean, I just Googled CSDMS help desk and it got me to this address pretty quickly. And then you can submit issues there. And the advantage of doing it that way, instead of like emailing us directly, is that there's a record of the questions and people can start mining these. And like Mark set this up, like, I don't know, a couple of months ago already. Um, but we're trying to point people to it too. Rena, can I, uh, can I take over? Yeah. I wanna, there's yeah, one go thing for I want to go before stop. people go. It, it'll be fast. Um, to get the very, when I, I must have been, there must have been a typo earlier when I couldn't do this. But when you, if you have an instance of a model like CEM, there's a dictionary called var, and the keys of the dictionary are the variable names. And you can run that and you can get information about each of the variables. That's all. So you can get the units, the grid, the, the whether it's input or output in the node location. So I don't know. I, th I think I had a typo before or something anyway. I wasn't going crazy, and it really is there. Sorry, Irene, if I interrupted you. No, you did not. OK. And there's all the variables for the CEM model. OK, anything else? Are we all done? I think so, unless anyone wants to ask more questions. All right. People are slowly dropping off. All right. All right. Well, let's call it. All right. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. Everybody. For thanks, everybody. Still here. A lot of fun.